1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to look at the last section. Uh, but let me do this just so that you realize what the chapter is about. I'm going to read verse 1 and then verses 27 through 31. So 1 Corinthians 12, 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that what this chapter is written for, that we wouldn't be ignorant of spiritual gifts, that by the time we're done with these verses, by the time we finish chapter 12 here, that we will not be ignorant of spiritual gifts. And yet, we, I pray that we'll strive to come back so that we might find the more excellent way that the chapter ends. But help us in our study to look at these verses that we have to look at today. Speak to all of our hearts, and, and may we know the truth of these things, and, and not just the doctrine of it, but the practice that uh, we're all called unto. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The outline of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, talk about being carried away even as they were led. And that is the Corinthians were carried away unto these dumb idols, even as they were led, as according to verse 2 and 3 there. And then verses 4 through 11, Paul lists the gifts and their purpose. And not all the gifts, because there's other places in, in Paul's epistles that speak of other gifts, but we study gifts and their purpose. Then we looked at verses 12 through 26 and saw gifts and the body of Christ. And now in verses 27 through 31, we want to see uh, God's placement in the church. And when we look at that, we'll actually see three things. God's placement in order and rank, and then the Spirit's enabling, and therefore the body of Christ's response. And, uh, and that, those are the things that we're going to study today. Now when we talk about God's placement in the church, maybe let me say this first. In, in verse 27, when it says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Uh, that's an important statement there. Uh, you know, there are people that are all kinds of different views of things. But when it says, now ye are the body of Christ, today we live in the dispensation of grace, where God sent the Apostle Paul out to the Gentiles to preach the gospel of grace, which is the good news is that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for all of our sins. He, did, he died for all mankind, Jews and Gentiles alike, but on the cross, he paid the penalty of all of our sins so that salvation is God's gift to us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the means by which you receive the gift. And, and Paul preaches how we're, we can be declared righteous before a holy God by faith in Jesus Christ. It's called justification by faith. And, and he went out to the Gentiles with this message. Prior to the Apostle Paul, your Bible's all about God's program for the Jews. And when God was dealing with the Jews, what he was creating is a nation that's going to be a testimony to the nations, which are the Gentiles of the world. So when Paul says in verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, God's doing something different today. You're not part of the nation of Israel. You're not part of their kingdom. That's earthly kingdom. You're part of God's eternal kingdom. But, but what, when God saves us today... He places us into Jesus Christ, and we have a position, a, a, a calling that's called, Now ye are the body of Christ. If you look over in verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's the body of Christ. But when you got saved, it's not a water baptism. It's when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God the Holy Spirit placed you in. That's what baptism means. John placed people in water. And he ministered to the nation of Israel. But here in the age of grace, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God the Holy Spirit takes the believer and places us into one body. And in that one body, there is a great unity and there's also a diversity. In the, when we talked about God, uh, the gifts and the body of Christ, the whole thing has to do with there's diversity. We're all different, just like our own body has different members, but it's one unity, one body. 
And so Paul has been teaching that, and then you come to verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ. And you became the body of Christ when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior in this dispensation of grace where God's not forming a nation, not fulfilling Israel's purpose, but doing something new and different in this dispensation that we've been invited to be a part of. And when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, that verse really makes it clear, now ye are the body of Christ. And members in particular, that shows the diversity and the unity as well. But then verse 28 says, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, government, diversity of tongues, and, and then we'll study the, the next verse after that. But the point is, is what you see in verse 27 and 28 is God's placement in the church, the body of Christ. When, when we talk about God's placement, we're talking about God's placement in time and in rank. Did you notice when you look at that verse, and God has set some in the church first apostles. So when he formed the body of Christ, it started out apostles are first. So that's first in, in order of all, all the gifts that were given. But then when you read the next one, it says secondarily prophets. It didn't say first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. It says first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, because you're not just talking about the order in time, you're also talking about rank. There's an order of position, of authority, and, and, and when you study the Bible, you realize that, you know, a lot of times we, we talk about the differences, how Colossians talks about how that Jesus Christ established the governments of the earth into principalities, powers, and dominions, and the heavens are divided into principalities, powers, and dominions. There's an order of authority in the heavens. There's an order, order of authority in the earth. We're to obey those that are in authority over us, it says in Romans chapter 13. And when you're reading here, you're reading, out, you're reading not only these different offices that God gave and men to fill those offices to the body of Christ, but there, he gave them in a certain order, and in that order is also order of authority rank, position, and, and so there's the, the, the three there uh, that starts out, and the, the three starts out as, a, as a, actually offices, uh, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and then notice that the next, after it goes one, two, three, then it says after that, Category four then just starts lumping a whole bunch of people together, and whether there's an order or rank there, it's not important. The order and rank was in the first three, and then, but even you can see there's first, there's secondarily, thirdly, after that. So that order and rank is really important when you look at this passage and, and see what he's doing here. Um, the, the offices uh, that are mentioned, the first three are actually offices. Uh, Gifts are given, and they're actually offices here, as we've read before in the book of Ephesians, we'll see again today. Um, they, they, uh, they're, they're men who hold the office, but then it breaks into five different gifts that are given. When it says, after that, it'll name five gifts, and, and by the way, when you get down to verse 30, it'll add another gift that wasn't mentioned in verse 28. And so you end up with six gifts, but three offices, six gifts that are, that are listed here. And, and there's, the, the, there's the office, that's the point, to, say, to call it an office, you realize there's gifted men that have to fill that office. But though the office is what has the authority. And, and the men certainly who fill that office has that authority there. And, and, uh, and so it starts out giving us that classification. Uh, just as the whole chapter then, shows what the purpose. When I said that we already studied what the, perp, the, the gifts and their purpose, you see it here that when it says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, those first three, and we, we say there, there's an order of priority, there's also an order of uh, authority in here, but every one of those, if you look at them, they have to do with revelation and communication of God's word. Certainly apostles and prophets, they're receiving revelation and a teacher is communicating that revelation. And he calls that not only an order, but also a rank in, that, in the sense that he gives those, those, those three. And, that, and that's what we've learned when we talk about the very purpose of spiritual gifts. When Paul said in verse 1, 
Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Why did God give spiritual gifts in the first place? Well, if you, you catch on to the introduction I just made, is that God, prior to the Apostle Paul, all your Bible has to do with God's program for the nation of Israel, which is now set aside because God raised up Paul and revealed something new that he never said before that, that has to do with Jew and Gentile-like believers in the age of grace. Well, what part of the Bible do we study? Well, when you start learning to rightly divide the word of truth, you realize what God's accomplishing today is found in Paul's epistles. That's why he wrote 13 epistles. That's why he wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else is he's not one of the 12 apostles to the 12 tribes of Israel. He's one apostle who's both a Jew and Gentile in one body to the body of Christ. And in, Paul, in Paul's epistles, we have God's word to us. Well, Paul is just now writing Corinthians. And when God called out of the Gentiles and in this new age a people for his name, God used apostles and prophets to give revelation to the saints about what his truth is and teachers to be able to communicate that. And there's other ways of communication. In fact, if, if you go back to chapter 12 and verse uh, 8, when we listed these gifts, I find it really important for you to understand the classifications because I see them here again at the end. It says, For to one is given, verse 8, by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, to another, faith, by the same Spirit. This is all God's revelation. And then it says, to another, the gift of healing, and uh, by the same Spirit, to another, the working of miracles. When we studied what is the purpose of healing and miracles in the Bible, it is to confirm that the person speaking is speaking by God. When Jesus Christ wanted to confirm the fact that He is the Messiah of Israel, He went about healing and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, because in His kingdom there's not going to be any sickness and suffering. When He sent the twelve apostles out to preach, He said, Go, into, uh, go in the, not in the way of the Gentiles in the cities of Samaria, enter ye not, but go unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, raise the dead, and so forth. He gave them miraculous powers and sent them out to, ver to, to preach, and those miraculous powers confirm. The last verse in, in Mark chapter 16 says, They went everywhere preaching the word, God confirming the word with signs following. So that the re the, my, my purpose in saying that, you see that they start out these gifts have to do with the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, uh, to another faith, and then comes the confirmation gifts. So there's a revelation gifts, then there's confirmation gifts, and then if you continue in the middle part of verse 10 there, it says, uh, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kind of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. That's communication gifts. You know what everything centers around when you talk about the gifts of the Spirit? The ministry of the Word of God. That's why over here he gave apostles, first apostles, secondarily prophets, those guys are receiving revelation, and thirdly teachers, someone to communicate that truth to others. Because the purpose of the gifts is to teach the revelation of God. The authority lies in the Word of God. And what we'll eventually conclude with today, as I hope to end with the, uh, an example out of the book of Ephesians, is that here apostles and prophets are being given because there is no Word of God for them to study. The revelation is being given. But once the full revelation is given, those gifts are going to end. And, uh, and, and so... For now, just the practical point of all this is the importance of God's Word. When it says firstly, secondly, thirdly, and it's all pointing to the Scriptures, your Scriptures is the final authority for faith and practice. You have, you have a complete Word of God today, and that is the final authority. A lot of people get away from that. But the Bible is your final authority. It's, it's the gift given to you. It's the gift of faith, that is God's word to us. And, and it has all the power and authority. It, it's found in the Bible.
So it's important for you to get that, and, and you can see it in the very fact that we start talking about in verse 28, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and then it says after that, it starts naming other things, which again, will f- starts out with those confirmation gifts, miracles and healings, and again, to confirm the word of God. So we'll, we'll get back to that issue in just, in, in just a little bit, but... There is, there is another thing to think about here, is you start out with the revelation gifts, and then and, and when those revelation gifts are given, they are supernaturally given by the Holy Spirit. We're talking about, if you look over in verse 4, it says, but it says now, uh, no, verse, verse 7, it says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So you learn two things there, that... The, the gifts that we're talking about are manifestation gifts. I mean, this is obvious that these th- th- things are happening that are beyond human power. This is supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and the purpose of them is to profit everybody. Not to profit one person, to give one person a, uh, an advantage over another, but the purpose it's given is to profit everybody because we're all different, but we're one body, and this is the Spirit's ministry to that body of Christ. Now, before we, we go on any further, I thought, you know, when I listed, we started this, I forget what number I came up with. I told you before, one of the reasons I was teaching, reteaching 1 Corinthians is I taught this years and years ago, one of my first books that I taught here at the church, and I've come to understand some things better and maybe different, and I thought, well, I'm going to throw away my old notes when I'm done with these new notes, uh, because if you compared them, you'd find out there, there's things that I taught then that I don't believe now. Uh, it's just growth and study. Uh, but what I did, I pulled out those old notes, and when I got to this section before, what we did is we spent, I don't know how many weeks, but we listed 21 gifts of the Spirit and defined and studied each one of them in the Bible. Now, that would take a long time, <laughs> but I thought, you know, I can't throw these notes away. That was a lot of work, and <laughs> that's, they're still true. Uh, some of the things I comment about them might not be true, but the gifts, they're, they're right out of the Scripture. So I thought, well, here we are in a, in a section, and before I go on, I thought, you know, it is important to get an idea of what some of these gifts are. So let, let's take the time to do that. In verse 28, it says, God has set some in the church first apostles. Now, apostle is one sent by God with a message. Uh, The Lord appointed out of the disciples 12 that he made apostles, and he sent them out when he went back into heaven. Their ministry then takes over. And he gave them the message that they're to preach. Paul tells us in Romans 11, uh, 13, he said, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. When God turned from Israel to the Gentiles, he raised up a different apostle, because the twelve were to the nation of Israel, and only after Israel is converted, we learned in the kingdom, after Jesus Christ comes back, will the twelve apostles go and teach the Gentile nations. Well, they never converted Israel, and God never fulfilled his promises to Israel. He will. That's in the future. But when God interrupted that program and raised up the apostle Paul, the age, the dispensation of grace, begins with one apostle, The apostle of the age of grace is the apostle Paul. But as he went out to minister to the Gentiles, you read in like Acts 14, verse 14, where it says, Then the apostles Barnabas and Saul. So as Paul went out and Barnabas went with him first, Barnabas is also called an apostle. When you read the book of 1 Thessalonians, you find out that it's written by Paul, and he includes with him at Timotheus, Timothy, and, and Silas. And it says there, we could have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, and that's plural. So that as, as the people went out and ministered with Paul, they ministered with Paul as, and I'm not using the secondarily here, but as a secondary apostle. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the only one who God used to write the the letters to the Gentile churches and and the doctrine for the age of the body of Christ. But there were ministering with him other apostles. For instance, Timothy, when we call him an apostle, when it comes to Timothy, it says in in Acts, him would God have go with Paul. I said that wrong, but what it is... (laughs) God would have Timothy travel with Paul. That was God's choice. 
Paul talks about how through prophecy there was the laying on of hands to Timothy. So that when Timothy was chosen to go with Paul, it wasn't just like, I like you, Timothy, you come with me. Or Timothy said, Paul, can I join you? No, that was all done by God. And Timothy is an apostle just like Paul, but he's not the apostle of the age of grace. But yet, when Paul sends him to Ephesus, it tells you in 1 Timothy chapter 1, that he is to go to, Timothy is to go to Ephesus and tell the elders, now that's the people who teach and rule the church at Ephesus, that they teach, to command them to teach no other doctrine. That is, no other doctrine than what God has given for the body of Christ through Paul. Now, for Timothy to walk in and tell the elders and command them what to teach and what not to teach, he had authority as an apostle. So, a, an apostle is one sent by God with a message, so they're called and commissioned and given power and authority. And while we're, what we're talking about here is... Uh, of apostles to the body of Christ. Now you are the body of Christ, and first God has sent us apostles. So just like Israel has apostles, the body of Christ had apostles, but we have one apostle who gave us the scriptures, God's word for us. Then there's prophets, that's secondarily prophets. A prophet doesn't have the same authority as an apostle, but he does have some authority, or he does have a, a special gift. And, and, and a, pro, a prophet is someone who has the ability that God, you need to understand this, that God speaks out of the mouth of the prophet. I, I wrote it this way. Uh, they don't, a prophet does not speak for God. God speaks through them. Because there are prophets in your Bible who would not say the things that are said except that God said it. And they, they even said that, uh, um, what is it, uh, Keep thinking Baal, but it's not Baal. Balaam and Balak. Uh, that he, he, he said, I can't help but say the things that God would have said. God, God's actually speaking out of his mouth. It's not like these guys speak for God. God speaks through them. That's what a prophet is. And sometimes the prophecies, we've already talked about this before, are things that are foretelling, just telling, just preaching. And sometimes it's foretelling. It's, some, it's not always telling the future, but sometimes it does. So he gave to the body of Christ first apostles, then he gave prophets, and then thirdly, teachers. And what a teacher is, he's an instructor. One who, not necessarily who receives the revelation, but one who studies the revelation in order to teach it and to preach it to others, causing the saints to understand the doctrine and the application of that doctrine. And Paul taught Timothy to take, take certain men and teach them to teach others also. And then he told even Timothy at the end of his life, preach the word. <laughs> so that uh, when we're talking about teachers, the idea of then is to study the, what the revelation of God is and to communicate it to others. So that you see the first, second, and third again has to do with the imparting of God's word. By revelation or communication, it's the imparting of God's word. Then comes the, the miracles after that in verse 28. And miracles, when you study it with the gift of miracles, that's wider in scope than just healing. Now the only examples you can give you of miracles are some that are done actually by the apostles themselves, whether it be Peter to his ministry or Paul to his. You see them doing things that are bigger than just healing. In fact, you see Peter striking some people dead. You see Paul striking a man with blindness. You see both Peter and Paul raise someone from the dead. Well, that's not just healing, that's miraculous. And so there's these gifts of miracles, and we already said that the purpose of miracles is to confirm that these people who are speaking, Peter, God speaking through Peter to Israel, Paul said it in the book of Galatians, He that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. God speaking through Paul to the Gentiles and confirmed it by the miracles that they did. So it's bigger than just healing, but the other gift that's listed there is gifts of healing. And when you say gifts, it, it, notice it says gifts of healings. It's plural. It's, it's almost like when the Lord went about healing, it, see, it said he healed all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. I don't know if you ever, <laughs> Sanjay and I years ago, we lived in Florida, we used to like, watch like Ernest Ainsley on TV. I think the guy's still around, but he's got to be pretty old by now. Every week, he would heal people of a sense of smell. 
That was the strangest thing. I, I thought, you know, someone trying to be some faith healer, why he would pick the sense of smell, and everybody coming up was getting their sense of smell. I didn't know that many people can't smell anything. <laughs> but I, I would say, even a person who can't smell anything, if you put uh, ammonia underneath their nose, I think their head's going to fly back. And uh, so anyhow, he was healing. I, I just say that because... Sometimes people try to he show, try to prove that there's healing ministries today, and they usually do it by internal, like even someone cancer, you can't see whether they have cancer, whether that cancer is gone or not, they just profess it to be so. But all men are sickness, and all men are disease. There's palsy, there's people that were demon-possessed, there's all kinds of sicknesses that people had in Bible days, and they were all healed. Even people who lame and couldn't walk, people who couldn't see, could now see, those things are obvious. And all manner. That healing, when it was going on, was real healing. None of that goes on today. Um, in, in, in Acts chapter 5, they brought out couches that if the shadow of Peter would just... People from all over the city, they're, they're lined up in the streets. That's why the idea of couches. And they're, they're sitting there on the street, and the shadow of Peter would pass by. It says it healed every one. Can you imagine that? Not one person in the city left sick. Everybody well. Well, anyhow, when there was healings, the purpose of healing is to show that God was speaking through Peter. When Paul did it, he says in 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Don't just believe he's an apostle. Look at the signs he did. And then you realize no man can do these things. God must be working through him and speaking through him. And so Paul had those same signs of an apostle. But then there's the gift of helps. That is to... to uh, the idea of helps is to take up for the, the helpless. Got a visitor up here. To take up for the helpless. Uh, uh, to, uh, to like take up their cause where uh, someone who's a helper doesn't just help someone. They, they see someone that has a need and they relieve that need by joining right into their problem. Get right involved in their problems where they can actually relieve, whether it be a sickness or, or infirmity or something, they can bring relief for that person. And there, there, there's the gifts of helps. Now here, here's some ministry things. The gifts of government, governments. And what that is, is that's the gift of administration, superintending. Uh, actually, the word has to do with guiding, steering a ship. And you know, I actually believe that, that some churches are huge churches, not because their pastor is some brilliant man with a lot of knowledge that people should go and hear, but he's just an administrator who knows how to work a situation and gather the people together, uh, because things need to be organized. And, and you, what you see here is, when you see rank and authority here, you see God's organization. We, we've learning that ever since chapter 11, about doing things decently and in order. And we'll see that in chapter 14 and 15 as well. But anyhow, there is this gifts that were given to actually administrate. And that's not always done by the apostles and prophets. And it, it would be more the local church ministry. The elders would do that. Then there's the last one on that gift. There's five in, that, in verse 28 there. You know what the last one is? Tongues. And you know what tongues were? Back at the Tower of Babel, God, we're going to learn more about tongues in chapter 14, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get there. But what tongues are, tongues was the ability to speak in all the languages of the world. And uh, in fact, the way it says that in verse 28 there, it says, diverse tongues, diversity of tongues. That is, there's all kinds of tongues, all kinds of languages. Ever since the Tower of Babel, God confused the languages. Raised, that's Genesis 11. Genesis 12, he raised up Abraham, that through him all the nations that are now divided up in the earth with different languages would, could be blessed. But now God raised up the Apostle Paul to go to Jew and Gentile alike. And the ministry to the body of Christ is to all people of all nations. Well, we all speak different languages. So when God began this ministry, he gave the gift of tongues, diversity of tongues, so people could speak in the languages of the world and communicate God's word. See, everything centers around the word of God. So that's what tongues were about. And it's, it's not until you get down to verse 30 that you find out that there's another gift, and it's called, the last part of verse 30, do all interpret. Because tongues, if you're in a group of people where, like here, most of us are English-speaking, probably all of us are English-speaking, 
But there could be someone among us that would speak uh, French or something, came from Canada or something, and they wouldn't understand what's being said, so an interpreter would then communicate that uh, to that one person. Uh, but but if, you ha if I had the gift of tongues and I could speak French and that person would understand, you wouldn't understand unless there was an interpreter. See, the whole gifts of the Spirit is everybody's got to get benefited by this, not just one person. And so there's not only the gift of, of tongues, but there's the gift of interpretation of tongues. And like I said, we'll learn more about that. So that when gifts were given, Paul said, don't be ignorant. Here's what, here's what God gave. And you, when you study them, you can see the purpose in them to the body of Christ. But then, what the Paul's point in this, for instance, when I said in verse 28, the very last one is tongues, realize that's the one most people want to talk about all the time. And that's not just in the world today, that's true in, at Corinth. When you get to chapter 14, you're going to find out that Paul is going to diminish the use of tongues to promote prophecy, the teaching of God's Word. Because it sounds like, when you read all this, that the people at Corinth were just, that's the one they wanted. Everybody wanted tongues. And Paul puts last on the list, and if you talk about importance, <laughs> rank, and, and order, that's, the, that's down on the bottom line here. And the, the Corinthians were ignorant of spiritual gifts, and Paul doesn't want them to be ignorant, he's teaching them. And one of the things he has to teach them is that when the Spirit enables, and that's what spiritual gifts, they're not natural gifts, even the gifts of help, we're not talking about, I naturally like to help people, or I naturally can govern, ministrate, we're talking about supernatural empowerment of the Spirit. And, and when the Holy Spirit gives, He not only, give, it, not only was it given supernatural ability that no man had. For instance, people who speak in tongues, they didn't study to learn how to speak in these languages. Then all of a sudden they could speak in the languages of the Gentile nations. No matter, and Paul, that's why he's going to say later, I speak in tongues more than you all. Look at where Paul traveled. He had to. But anyhow, they're, they're, they're supernatural in, empowerment. And they're also diverse and divided. Verse 4 says, Now the, there are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. So it's not you know, just one gift. We're, we just studied, uh, what, nine of them just now. And then verse 11 says, But all these worketh the one and selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. That is, he, there's diverse kind of tongues, and he decides who's going to get which gift. Diverse kind of tongues, no. Diverse kind of gifts, and the Holy Spirit is deciding who gets what gifts. Now, that's important to know. The Spirit decides. Someone doesn't just want it. The Spirit gives it. And, and so when we talk about the Spirit's enabling here, look at verse 28, uh, 29. It says, Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? So he goes back through those gifts again. And by the way, he does the revelation gifts, the confirmation gifts, and the communication gifts. He threw out helps and government. Did you notice that? He didn't go back to that. And then he adds one called interpretation of tongues. Just interesting. That's why you look at things, you go, oh, wow, I see that. <laughs> it's back to that same division that was earlier in the chapter. But the question, do, are all apostles? Well, of course not. When you studied what, don't be ignorant of spiritual gifts, there's different gifts and the Spirit decides, divides it severally as He wills. And so not everybody is an apostle. Not everybody is a prophet. Not everybody is a teacher. Are all workers of miracles? No. Do all, uh, do, do all have the gift of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. It's obvious what that answer is because the Spirit divides it. And they all don't have the same gift. So if that's true, look at the problem at Corinth. Go over to chapter 14. First part of verse 23. If the whole church come together into one place, and all speak with tongues. Well, wait a minute. If that was true, there's something wrong there, right? Because not all, everybody has the gift of tongues. So Paul talks to them about that. Look at verse 25, 26. It says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, 
hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. How is that possible, brethren? It's not possible that it's by the Spirit of God. It's possible they're doing that because they're ignorant of spiritual gifts, and they all want these spiritual gifts, and particularly they all wanted tongues. And if you see the whole church come together and they're speaking with tongues, it's not the Spirit of God. You can sing, there's a sweet, sweet Spirit in this place, but it's not the Spirit of God because when God was doing it, they didn't all have those same gifts. The Spirit divided severally as He will. And, and so those gifts weren't given to everyone. And, uh, at, but at Corinth, they were messing things up. They, they, everybody wanted to be a prophet, oh, wanted to be a, an apostle, wanted to speak with tongues. Well, they might want that, but that's not what the Spirit gave. And so the church wasn't properly using the gifts for the reason God gave them. So with that information in mind, you come to verse, six, uh, you come to verse 31. And here is, based on what he just said, the body of Christ's proper response. This would be the proper response of the body of Christ. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now wait a minute, Tom. You said you can't just covet a gift and then the Spirit give it to you. The Spirit gives it to who He wants it to give. You know what the answer to that verse is? It says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, plural. That's the body of Christ needs to covet the best gifts. That is, you know, what is the best gifts? How about apostle, prophet, and a teacher? That would be, what we already learned, would be the best gifts. And as a local assembly, they ought to covet someone who's an apostle so they could hear God's word from him, a prophet so God could speak to them directly through that man's mouth, and if they didn't understand those things, a teacher to explain it to them. That's coveting the best gifts. But that's not an individual because that's contrary to everything he just taught. It's not an individual coveting the gift. It's the body of Christ coveting the best gifts, desiring the ones and the best gifts center around understanding God's word. <laughs> you see how it all fits together? And, and so they're to covet earnestly the best gift. And then he says, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. Wow. You certainly covet the best gifts. And then there is a more excellent way. You know, you go best to excellent. Which is better? One is good and one is better. <laughs> but you go from better, but now I show you a more excellent way. There's something better than coveting even the best gifts. And I won't leave you hanging. This verse leaves you hanging. I won't leave you hanging because if you get to chapter 13, most people understand and been around enough to know 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to 13 is called the love chapter. It's going to use the word charity, the King James use of the word love, because it's, it's, charity explains its total giving. And what's the more excellent way than gifts is love. And the last verse of chapter 13 will explain to you why it's more excellent than gifts. It's, well, I'll read the last two verses. Verse 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. You know why charity is the more excellent way? It abides. It never ends. You know what's going to happen to the gifts of the Spirit? They're going to end. So Paul's preparing them that it's going to end, and he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way, and when you get to chapter 13, that's going to be the more excellent way. God's going to motivate people not by supernatural empowerment, but by love to go out and serve one another. And then, remember, covet earnestly the best gifts? That's what chapter 14 is about. Chapter 14, they're all coveting tongues, and he's going to teach them, no, 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 the better gift would be prophecy. And, and he's, that's what chapter 14 is covered, going to teach them how to covet the best gift, and that is to have, rather choose prophecy over tongues. So that's the more better way. Now when I tell you, when we get to chapter 13, what I just said to you is that 
that, tongue, that the supernatural gifts of the Spirit are going to end. Chapter 13 is going to teach us that, and it's going to teach us why it's going to end. But before I teach it out of chapter 13, I want you to see this whole thing from Ephesians chapter 4. So take your, go over to Ephesians chapter 4. Now if you know Paul's epistles, there's these pre-prison epistles that Paul wrote early in his ministry as he traveled. The last days of his life he was imprisoned in Rome and he wrote prison epistles. And in his prison epistles are the final completion of God's word given to him. And he's going to talk about gifts of the Spirit here. And I want you to see, if you don't understand everything I'm going to teach, I just want you to see a little outline that you can understand, again, the purpose of gifts and understand they have ended. If you, in verse 7, it says, of Ephesians chapter 4, it says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, I'm not going to explain a whole lot of things here. I want to be concentrate on giving gifts to men. But he gave gifts to men when he ascended up on high. When you look at verse 10, he ascended up on high far above all principalities and powers in the heavens. See, when Jesus Christ first rose from the dead, he spent 40 days on earth, and then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. But when he called the Apostle Paul to go to the Gentiles, God the Father instructed Jesus Christ to be ascend far above all principalities and powers in heaven. Because the purpose of the body of Christ is to replace that authority in the heavens. Because Satan and his angels have a place in those heavens. So when it says that he gave gifts to men, it's after Jesus Christ ascended into the far heavens, and that's where he called Paul from. Now, if I... So, from that exalted position, what you'll see clearly, you won't have to take my word for it, that these are gifts to the body of Christ, not gifts to the nation of Israel on the day of Pentecost when God was dealing with Israel. But first of all, he gave gifts, and then what did he give? Verse 11, he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, there's a new one in for us, and some pastors and teachers. See, all of it has to do with the Word of God and getting the Word of God out, right? Evangelist preaches to the lost people. Teachers preach to the saved people. And, and so he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why did he give it? For the perfecting of the saints. Perfecting bring, is to bring the saints to maturity, to build up those saints. Why? Because It says, for the, work of the, uh, uh, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. You know who does the work of the ministry? Perfected saints. So he gave these gifted men for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. See, this is to the body of Christ. This is not to the nation of Israel. So Jesus Christ, when he ascended up on high, gave gifts to men for the body of Christ, for to perfect them, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the, the ongoing teaching of the body of Christ. Notice verse 13, the first word. Till. What do you mean till? Back up in verse 11. And he gave. That's past tense, isn't it? He gave. And then now at verse 13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Now that does not mean till every believer in the body of Christ Un believes the same thing and understands all the, what Christ has done, what we become in Christ. That's not what the unity of the faith is. You know what the unity of the faith is? I said to you, God's gift to you is His Word. And the unity of the faith is the complete Word of God. How do I know that? Well, look at verse 5. It says there's one Lord. How many faiths? One faith. We're not talking about what people believe. You know what the one faith is that's been given to the body of Christ? is Paul's epistles. <laughs> the completion of God's word to us. And God gave these gifts till we come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. There's no missing information that you need to have today. It's all there in God's word in Paul's epistles. And what that'll do, notice the middle of that verse says, unto a perfect man. <laughs> God's word is able to perfect you. <laughs> 
That's why the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible can perfect you. You don't need a prophet. You don't need an apostle. You don't need a teacher. You need God's word. Now you might need a teacher to help you understand God's word, but God's word will do that. When you have the, 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 the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, it's unto a perfect man, unto the measure or the stature of the fullness of Christ. It'll bring you full, all the way to completion. Notice the next phrase in verse 14. That we henceforth. Now if you get anything out of this, gave is past tense, till, meaning it's going to end, and then henceforth what goes on after that. So he gave gifts till we come to the unity of the faith, till we have a complete word of God, that henceforth, what's, what happens now? Watch it. That henceforth, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Remember how 1 Corinthians 12 started out? I would not have you ignorant brethren concerning spiritual gifts, that you were led about by these dumb idols. A dumb idol doesn't speak. How were they led about? Well, somebody was saying something deceiving the Corinthians. But now if you have a complete word of God, you don't have to be a child tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. You want to know what God said? You don't have to listen to a man. You might listen to a man, but then you'll look at the Bible and says, is he saying what God said or not? That's 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, by the way. So that now that we have a complete word of God, that henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men or cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. A lot of people are out there trying to deceive you. But you've got a Bible that will tell you not to, how not to be deceived. But instead, remember this is part of henceforth, but speaking the truth in, uh, the, the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. We're all put into this body of Christ. That which every joint supplieth to the effectual working and the measure of every part. That's God working his word in your life, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, there's an illustration. I could explain to you a little bit about mechanics. Uh, Used to love tinkering on cars until they got too confused, confusing <laughs> with all the new electronics that are on them. But the basic part about a car you understand. That is, you take your key and you put it in that car and you turn it and a starter starts cranking the engine. And then the engine starts and you let go of that key and hopefully the starter quits. Otherwise you hear a lot of grinding and a lot of problems and you're really getting a problem. The point is, is to get a car started, you have to crank that engine a couple times. That's got to turn a couple times to get the pistons firing and there's an explosion going on in the engine. And that's, once that spark and the gas all start uniting, it starts spinning and it keeps itself running. So you don't need a starter. You just need a starter to get it started. And after it's started, you don't need the starter anymore. When I, every time I read this passage, I think about an engine. That when Jesus Christ ascended on high to form the body of Christ, he gave apostles, so prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to get it all started. They needed God's word. Because it's God's word that's going to work effectually in the believer. But once it gets started, he gave it till we come to the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God. We have God's complete word now. Now we don't have to be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, but what happens as we speak the truth in, lie, in, in Christ, the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth. The pistons are moving now. They're running. They're sparking. Unto the increase of the body, unto the edifying of itself in love. It's self-perpetuating now. He had to get it started and give us God's word, but once we got God's complete word, now God uses the word in the believer because all those gifts of the Spirit, while we don't believe that supernaturally the Holy Spirit is dividing gifts to every different one, there's still a work of ministry to go on. There's still the work of an evangelist that needs to go on. There's still the work of teaching that needs to go on. There's still the, the need for helps and governing and, and, and all the different, if we would look at all the different gifts, there's still the ministry that needs to go on, but it doesn't need Jesus Christ up there cranking it up, trying to get it to go. It's going. 
And now we just take God's word and God's word starts working in you. And the Bible talks about how God's work, faith worketh by love. You start studying the Bible and now love is the motivation that causes you to do the different work of the ministry. Not the Holy Spirit empowering you and moving you, but God's word working in you and the love of God constraining you to realize, man, if I know the gospel, I, there's neighbors that don't know the gospel. I need to give them the gospel. His love motivates you to do it. That's the more excellent way because it's not an engine constantly cranking. It's the word of God now running. And that we live in that time period now where we have the complete word of God and the word of God will motivate us out of love to go out and serve and not just think of ourselves, but to serve one another. And the whole purpose of those gifts was to give us God's word to get us to this point. Where that's long ago happened. And we'll see that again. We'll see it out of chapter 13 when I study, we study together chapter 13. But we've got introduced and Paul said, don't be ignorant of spiritual gifts. They all center around us having God's word. It's the final authority. You need to love the Bible. And God, if God works effectually in you as you read the Bible, or as the Bible gets into you, you need to be reading it. You need to be coming together and studying it so that God can use it in your life to serve him. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do thank you that we don't have to be ignorant of the things that sometimes we see ignorantly happening all around us that if we just, sometimes we have to be patient to learn, but we're going to get it out of your word so that we're not tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. But we can understand from your word exactly what you have been doing, why you did it, how you're working today. And Father, we do pray that we're not lazy Christians, that we will let your word work effectually in us and that your spirit to motivate us out of love to go out and do all the different things that need to be done, one to another, but even to the lost world around us. So thank you for the things that we've learned so far and looking forward to that chapter 13 where we learn about charity. In Christ's name we pray, amen.